committee and this event. We apologize for how crowded it is. We didn't expect this many people, but that's a really good thing that you guys are all here. And if you guys need to use the bathroom, it's just right back to this room. And just go to the uh, stained glass doors, the really pretty ones with all the lights. Easy to be. And Justin, right. to a little bit more. I'm going to give a uh, brief intro about who we are, what we do. And again, it's the uh, APSC, that's short for the Asian Prison Support Committee. And what we do is uh, we provide legal assistance and support for Asian prisoners. And we try to bring a uh, consciousness to the uh, Asian American community about what's happening with the uh, prison industrial complex. And once again, thank you for coming out here. Sorry it's so crowded, but that's a good thing because we didn't expect this, this uh, many people. And uh, all right, let's get on. All right, we have a great lineup set up for tonight. And to start the night off right, let's give it up for the Team Mighty Mountain Warriors. Yeah. 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 Uh, you hear me in the back? Yeah. Kinda? Yeah, yeah kind of. All right. Uh, my name's Aaron. I'm with the 18 Mountain Warriors. We're an Asian American sketch comedy troupe. And, um, a lot of the work that we do, I guess, surrounds images of Asian Americans, and we also do a lot of work that offers uh, political satire and social commentary as well. Um, we were fortunate enough to be invited uh, at one point in time by Yuri Kochiyama to perform as a, uh, part of a fundraiser for the David Wong uh, Legal Defense Fund, who's an Asian prisoner as well in the Midwest. And that's kind of how we uh, dovetailed into a lot of uh, the support activities behind a lot of the work that's going on for Asian prisoners. Uh, our work doesn't necessarily speak directly towards the rights of Asian prisoners per se, but we're here tonight to show our support for the Asian Support Committee. And um, in this era of uh, restricted rights, and as we move more towards a police state with the passage of the Homeland Security and the Patriot Act, not to mention the Shin and War Act of 1896, which is still in effect during wartime. As long as we have jackass resident, I'll try not to interject too much of my personal politics here. <laughs> it's important for all of us to speak out and exercise our full rights as citizens here. So, with that, the piece that we're going to do tonight is a, a piece called Book Color Paranoid. Uh, it's a piece that is actually more focused on immigrant rights. And uh, it's a piece that I wrote actually when uh, I came home and my dad, after 28 years, decided to become uh, a naturalized citizen. And uh, I saw a sample exam on the table, and this is kind of what came out of it. So we'll take that. Am I pretty? You are hot. You. Hi. Welcome. Hello. Are you here to take a test? Perhaps. Perhaps. Perhaps I'm here to take a test, maybe, maybe not. What to you, Mr. White? Well, I'm the test administrator here, so if you're here to take a test, I'll be giving it to you. Well, 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 how appropriate that this test is to be administered by Mr. White! <laughs> no, that's Mr. Wright. Of course, of course, Mr. White is Mr. Wright! How appropriate! <laughs> My name is Mr. Wright, not Mr. White. But it's the same thing. Can't you see? Don't you see? Mr. White is Mr. Wright, because white is right is might. Haven't you ever heard that white guys are the right guys? Haven't you ever heard that, Mr. Hugh White? <laughs> and what is your name, sir? My name is irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> I am a non-entity as evidenced by the fact I need to take a test to become somebody in this country. And ultimately, my name is the name you call me by because you represent the dominant culture, the oppressor, the destroyer. Isn't that right, Mr. He White? Mr. Wright! Wait, right, 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 Do you have an appointment? <laughs> Perhaps. Perhaps I'm here to find out why I need to take a test in the first place to become a citizen. 
in the land of the free. Participatory democracy and freedom all have their costs. The purpose of the test is to determine your knowledge of the history of the United States and its laws so they can participate as a more enfranchised citizen. So, by passing this test, I will become an enfranchised citizen. <laughs> How naive of you. Do you have an appointment? Perhaps. <laughs> My name is Robert E. Lee. <laughs> the same as that of the illustrious Confederate general that fought against the abolition of slavery and stood for the systematic subjugation and disenfranchisement of Africa slaves living in America, but you could call me Bob E. <laughs> All right, Bobby, we'll no, let you see me. Bobby! Bob E. I see you do have an appointment here. Would you like to take the test? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Great, let's start. Question number one. Who discovered America? A. George Washington, B. Christopher Columbus, or C. Abraham Lincoln? America. <laughs> was never discovered. <laughs> Answer the question A, B, or C. It was never discovered. The very question, the fair game perspective, is a misrepresentation of history. His story. <laughs> <laughs> I call into evidence the inaccuracy of the question itself. America was never discovered. It was conquered. America was never discovered. It was stolen through shady contracts, selling away the land. America was never discovered. It was captured through the bloodshed of its native peoples in the name of imperialism for the white man. Answer the question, A, B, or C. America was never discovered. <laughs> Slavery and racist principles are the basis of the Constitution. America was never discovered because the new world is the old world with ten times the evil. America was never discovered because it is not now, has never been, and never will be what it promised to be! <laughs> A, B, or C! <laughs> I'm sorry! I wasn't listening! <laughs> Could you repeat the question? Okay, you get that one wrong, Bobby. The answer is B. <laughs> and the name is Bob E! Don't start with that again! White is right! White is right! Stop White it! Is right. Stop it! No! Next question! Name three rights in the Bill of Rights! Number one. The right to bear arms to kill people to combat a racist infrastructure. <laughs> Number two, freedom of speech. The right to bear arms, speak freely about it, and kill people to combat a racist infrastructure. <laughs> Number three, freedom of religion. The right to worship a god that empowers me to bear arms, speak freely about it, and kill people to combat a racist infrastructure. <laughs> okay, you failed the test. <laughs> what do you mean I failed? You failed. I can't fail. I'm a citizen. You what? I'm a U.S. citizen! I was born here! Well, then why are you taking the test? To fuck with you! <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's say it again for Eddie Mighty Mountain Okay, my name is Prothop, and I want to tell you a little bit about the space. This is Locus. Locus, it's an Asian American, Asian Pacific Islander art space, and we have events here twice a month. It's uh, Wednesdays, and if you're interested in finding out more about the events, you should check out our website, www.locusarts, L-O-C-U-S, arts.org. And we, other than the two Wednesday events, uh, the next event, Marilyn, is the, the uh, work event, right? Yes. Marilyn, do you, uh -huh. you want to explain what it is? May 7th. May 7th, okay. And there's also an open mic, which happens the last Tuesday of the month, except this month, it's the last Wednesday of the month. So um, check out the website if you want to know more about, or if you want to volunteer here, come and speak to me or Marilyn, who's in the back, whom you can't see, but she's right in the back. <laughs> And with that, I want to introduce the next uh, performer, who is Sharjah Patel. And Sharjah Patel. Woo! Woo!
incredible. I can see heads like you know packing the doorway. This is amazing. Thank you all of you for being out here oh. and being out here for justice and peace in a time when it's, it's hard to believe that either of them's ever going to prevail. But we're out here and we have voices and we are a people and we're going to keep standing for that until things change. Yeah. So, I'm going to start, two of the pieces I'm going to do tonight are actually by a friend of mine, Pablo Dosh, who some of you may know, inspired poet, inspiring activist, who now lives in Minneapolis, but was a tutor in the San Quentin College program, and a, a personal friend and admirer of Eddie Zeng, and he breaks down the prison industrial complex in poetry the way no one else does, so I'm going to do a couple of his pieces. This first one is Guided Tour. Clean, green, steel, top of the line, hexagonal design, views from all angles. Polished, smooth, glass, yes, we make every provision since this meal is your last. Mm. McDonald's, large Dr. Pepper, you name it, we'll get it, cause nothing too unreasonable. No, we must remain reasonable. Little cozy with 80 people packed in to watch, but given the occasion a little discomfort isn't all that bad. The family of the victim here, the family of the condemned here, the media in between. Justice here, forgiveness here, the media in between. Closure here, emptiness here, righteous vengeance, punishment, helpless disbelief, mercy. The media keeps it clean. Sir, curtains cover the polished smooth glass. They'd like to see it from beginning to end, but sometimes there's a little tussle and, well, we wouldn't want any accusations of cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> we're not like Texas. They run an assembly line down there. Not us. We're different. Why, we only average one a year since 92 because of the safeguards. Yes, we're very careful about the safeguards. It may not look it, but there's plenty of room in here. The family of the victim here, the family of the condemned here, the media in between. Justice here, forgiveness here. Look further, what can be seen? Closure here, emptiness here, emptiness here, closure here. Is there an in-between? Animal, human, butcher, child, monster, please. Or only these extremes? Of course, they all choose injection. You see, California currently provides a choice. Injection or gas. And they all choose injection. Excuse me. You don't mind if these folks take a look at your little home here, do you? Oh, no, sir. No, I don't mind at all. I don't mind that I'm in my underwear. I don't mind that 60 college students are gawking at a poor old black man hardly dressed inspecting his pitiful shithole of a home. My god. Eight by eight by four. Bars and iron grating so tight I need a lamp at high noon. Yeah, my little home where every day is a new moon. My sliver of territory with no deed but your word subject to daily conquest resistance. Absurd. Sure, come on into my humble abode, seeing as how it's totally necessary, seeing as how this week's camera-clicking caravan could not conceivably look at one of the other cells in Tier 1, all 59 of which are at present vacant. I'm proud to be a part of the San Quentin guided tour. Do come back soon, but will you sit here or here or in? between seeking uncertain hesitation weeping uncertain intervention protection action we need this she was only a teen how satisfaction what about our dream here the family of a victim here the family of a victim seek the in-between <laughs> currently here to honor and support and fight for the, the rights and the liberty of. So as an introduction to the work of Eddie Zeng, I'm going to read a, a poem written again by my friend Pablo Dosh. Um, these pieces are in chat books, which I have three copies of available for donations, which will all go to the fund that we're supporting tonight. 
So, to introduce Eddie Zeng. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. You have broken the yoke of burden, the rod of oppressors. Your name is proclaimed wonderful counselor of youth, prince of peaceful resistance. But in the black bowels of San Quentin slave ship, they brand you. Blue shirt, D-22, 827, dangerous threat to robbery at 16. But these feeble brands cannot be heard over the roar of your waters. Your non-violent currents endanger their yoke. Your poetic waves threaten their rod. Your truth stirs turbulence. You are River Eddie Zeng, and your river will rise. They convict you as an adult, but your convictions only grow. They damn you to cold hell, but no damn can hold your flow. Prism beats you down, Eddie, but you lift us up. They give you violence. You teach prisoners alternatives to violence. They deny you legal counsel. You counsel at risk youth. Interrogators give you the third degree. You earn a college degree. You lift us up, Eddie. They give you a life sentence. Your prose reveals the power of a sentence. They club you for speaking out. You lead a public speaking club. They lock you in the slam. You start the San Quentin Poetry Slam. You lift us up, Eddie. They take away exercise. You exercise free speech. They take away paper. You write poems on the walls. They take away walls. That would be something. <laughs> <laughs> they take away pencils. You craft poems in your mind. They try to take away your mind. You just smile. They take away light. Light? They take away light for 48 nights and 48 nights. But you burn brightest in the night. After 30 days of light, speech, sensation, deprivation, a counselor asks what you need, and all you can ask for is that he help your neighbor. Damn, you lift us up, Eddie. And right now your rising tide is lifting people up. Just listen to them. You lift us up, Eddie. Let's hear it, everyone. You lift us up, Eddie. Yeah, I can feel it. I see faces getting excited. A Chinese-American man shaking off the frigid shivers of cold hell. And people are so excited, they are shouting out, You lift yes, us up, Eddie. Eddie! Shouting so loud that Governor Gray hears it all the way in Sacramento, <laughs> inviting us to proclaim, fight, celebrate, write, work, sign, protest, run, join this inspired cause so that the parole board or no, Eddie will move to a new stage and be greeted by a thunderous cry of, You lift us up, Eddie! You not only walk on water, you are flowing water. Your rushing waters are equality yearning, injustice overturning, and no matter what they do to you, repeatedly returning. You are River Eddie Zeng. Your peace will flow like river, and this river will rise. Oh. of amazing, incredible, inspiring activists, our best, our brightest, our most gifted, Mumia Abu-Jamal and the whole lineage that follows him, who are being locked up, who are being silenced, who are being annihilated because they are speaking out against what's happening to us, and we will not forget them. So to finish, I am going to read a piece by Eddie Zeng. Hello, my name is Eddie. I'm a prisoner. What's your name? Before you walk away, did I mention that I am someone's brother, nephew, uncle, friend, son, hello, my name is Eddie. More importantly, I am a person. Prisoner? It's just another name. Some people call me. I am a prisoner. What is your name? It does not mean I am no longer a human being. Surely it does not mean I do not have feelings. Hello, my name is Eddie. Be not afraid. Because with you, without you, there is no me. For I am a reflection of society, and society is a reflection of me. I am a prisoner. What is your name? My name is Eddie. Give me a chance and get to know the real me. <coughs> Hello, my name is Eddie. A student, educator, lover, homie. Despite what name others choose to call me, I am a prisoner. What is your name? Please do not let a name stop you from being my friend. My name is Eddie.
I know why I am in prison. Why do you choose to be imprisoned? My name is Eddie. <laughs> so I heard that there's a lot of people all the way in the back near the door, and um, this may sound like a somewhat absurd request, but um, <laughs> ask people to get closer together, um, and it's actually, maybe we should have talked about this before Shadja went up because she talked about Eddie Zhang a lot, and so now we finally have an opportunity to tell you who Eddie is and who his friends are and what they're trying to do. Um, so, really quick, we're, there's actually two cases that we're working on right now. I'm going to talk about the first one, and then Sharon's going to talk about the second one. Okay. So first, um, so there's a prison in the Bay Area in, in Marin. It's called San Quentin State Prison. I'm sure people are somewhat familiar with that. Um, so, in San Quentin, there's a lot of Asian American inmates that are there. And um, there's an education program, which is the only prison education program in, in California. It's all volunteer run. There used to be a lot more education programs all around the country, but in the early 1990s, the federal government withdrew all federal funding from prison education programs. So the one at San Quentin has continued because it's all volunteer run. So, you know, a lot of these inmates are, take these classes, uh, and then, uh, you know, they've, it's been going on for many years now. So there's been a few inmates that got together, and they, be, they began thinking more about these classes. Some of the classes offer, like, algebra, writing, um, basic communication classes, intro to econ, and things like that. But they begin to think and get, get a little more critical about, you know, what really is the role of this education program that they're being offered at San Quentin? And, you know, I myself, in personal experience, I volunteered as a tutor in the education program. There would be times when we would leave the, the prison after our weekly um, tutorial session, and the lieutenant and the, the warden, the assistant warden at the prison would be oh, thanks a lot, guys. You guys are doing a great job. So we began to think, like, what exactly is our role? I mean, are we just an extension of the wardens? Like, what's going on? And they began to be thinking, is this education program really in place just to distract us and uh, keep our minds occupied from the other stuff, the brutality that we face, that they face on a daily level? And so they got together, and they signed a petition, and they demanded that the prison education program offer ethnic studies classes, mm. and specifically Asian American studies classes, because they wanted classes that were relevant to their histories, they wanted to learn about the histories of Chinese people in America, of other Asian folks in America. They also wanted to learn about the history of the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, the history of the Palestinian liberation movement. So they wanted a relevant education because they began to also realize at the same time that most of them were never going to get out. So what really is the point of learning supply and demand graphs? You're never ever going to get out of prison. Because of all, you know, Gray Davises and all these other policies that we'll go into maybe a little bit later. Um, so three Asian American inmates signed a petition for ethnic studies at San Quentin, and that's um, Eddie Zhang, who Shao Zhe talked about, is a Chinese American <coughs> inmate from Oakland. Um, is Oakland in the house? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then there's Viet Mike No, who's Vietnamese. Woo! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> and the, uh, a Filipino brother named Rico Remedio. They all signed this petition. There's no Filipinos here? Woo! <laughs> so they signed this petition. As soon as they presented that petition, within you know a few weeks, they were all thrown into the hole, which is solitary confinement, and they were all separated. They were sent to different prisons, and you know they're very confused. Like, what's going on? We're just trying to get more classes added to this education program. It's all volunteer run. But they were thrown into the hole because clearly the prison administration sees what they did as a threat, you know, to the power and the authority that the warden wields over them. They don't take well to any sort of collective action on the part of prisoners, but in, in any sense. Three people signed the petition, you know? And these are Asian American Studies classes. Most of us in this room have taken Asian American Studies classes, right? A lot of us have also fought for these Asian American Studies classes, and we've also had a, you know, face the backlash on that, and so we feel it's important to stand with our brothers and, you know, our sisters that are fighting for that and, you know, facing direct punishment as a result. Um, so, so that's pretty much that case. So they all got, after that, they got thrown in solitary confinement, they had, they were investigated for you know unknown reasons, and then the prison found they, they charged them with a series of baseless violations that they put on their record. So right now they're challenging those violations. They're trying to get support, and you know, so there's nothing to it. That's all they're trying to do is get extra classes. And so we're working with them and trying to get legal representation and trying to get people support around that and um, just increasing awareness around that. And so that that's case number one. And then Shane's going to talk about this. Hello, everybody.
everybody. Hello. 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 Um, actually, you know, the cases are related. One of the San Quentin three, be it Mike No, is another case that we're working on. Um, I want to add a little bit about the ethnic studies case. It was actually signed by five inmates. Only the three Asian prisoners, for whatever reason, were um, were retaliated against. But it was also signed by a Jewish American prisoner and um, an African American prisoner. So it's just another example of people crossing racial lines um, to work together to organize inside, which is a really huge feat. Actually, the second case that we're working on is um, challenging the policy of racial segregation in prison. Um, if anyone, I don't know very much about it either, but I do understand that the policies in prison are pretty much comparable to um, de facto apartheid. So the fact that they did that with the education program is one thing, but it's another thing that all of the inmates together were not only working across racial lines, but also um, working inside the prison at the same time that they were challenging other uh, arenas of the way the prison industrial complex works. A lot of them, all three of them, all three of the prisoners had um, legal work in the courts too um, against the CDC. I was going to say a little bit, I'm, I'll add a little bit more, but if, um, actually we have the privilege of having Eddie and um, Rico and Mike's lawyer here. So I'm going to ask him instead to maybe go over the bare facts of the case and he can probably talk about it, um, the case, a little bit more just for a couple minutes. This is Charles Carbone. He works at California Prison. Okay. Hello, everyone. As, um, as Sharon said, I've been the, the lawyer to Rico in a parole case we recently got denied, where essentially uh, Rico was denied parole for a rules violation that as a result of um, this bogus investigation against him has kept him from his freedom, which is a very difficult thing to attain in the state of California if you're a life prisoner. The board had recommended twice before that, that Rico be up for parole and be given a release date, and the governor took it twice. He went before the board this third time and was denied because of this incident. Um, I'm going to say a couple very quick things about all three of these people and Stefan and the content of their character, and then just very briefly about the racial segregation case. It's many times that I've seen Eddie at about 8 o'clock in the morning in administrative segregation at San Quentin, which he describes as a communal bathroom with bars. It's not a fun place that you want to be for 15 minutes, much, much less years and years. I've visited a lot of people who have done time for 15 years, 20, 18 years in solitary confinement. I've seen what it can do to people. It breaks people, and other people, they transcend it. And Eddie is the type of person that, the look in his eyes, you know, staring through glass, is um, a love of justice and a, a sense of deep purpose. And it's something I think we all share and we all learn from. So, in terms of the people that we're fighting for, um, they're really teaching us as many lessons as we could possibly learn from them. One other quick thing about Eddie, just in terms of the work that you're doing and, and in the way that you're honoring him, I came into my office and there was a man who was helping us with our work and he was in tears. And I said, what, what is going on? What, what's wrong? What happened? He said that we had put a poem of Eddie's on the wall, his autobiography, and he had read it, and he had done time. Mm. And he knew exactly what Eddie felt. And um, I know that he has touched many of us in a, in a very similar way. So that's not to say that, I mean, all three of them and Stefan, they are all exceptional people, and I think those are small examples of who they are. In terms of their case, basically when you come into San Quentin, the very first thing they say to you is, do you have any enemies? Who are people out there that you might get in, in, in conflict with? If you have an open heart and you say, I have no enemies, I you know, get along with all races, they say, oh, that's great, that's wonderful to hear, and they stick you in a cell with someone of your same race. And that goes on in San Quentin and it goes on throughout the Department of Corrections. This case is part of another case that declared lockdowns unconstitutional, and now we're looking at racial segregation and cell assignments. Basically, prison is the most racially segregated society on the face of the planet, and all Asians are considered, pan-Asian, whomever you are, you're one giant other to the prison institution. That's the level of sophistication and understanding where people are coming from and who they are. So I would encourage all of you to come. It's Friday, May 23rd. <laughs> May 23rd, we're going to put it on. We're going to school the Department of Corrections, and we'd love to have you there. Yes. Thank you.
23rd is the hearing. It's going to be in Marin. Um, we have an email address. It's sq3solidarity at Yahoo. So if you guys if you want to come out in numbers, we can maybe try to work together on a carpool. I can at least give you directions on how to get there. Um, because, yeah, you know, to pack the courthouse is a big deal, you know. Um, I know it would mean a lot to Mike to see faces. So, um, so email. And it's on, also um, a lot of the information is on the, the handouts that you might have. I also just wanted to say something, um, just to put a little bit more context on the case because I've been working on it some myself and um, I've been corresponding with Mike and got to know them, um, all three of us in Quentin Three for a couple of years now. And I just wanted to say that, um, that it's really their work is not so much about political reform, it's not so much about identity politics or even about anti-Asian violence specifically, but I think it's really trying to challenge state violence that affects all people. So it, it takes it out even of even like a racial context, of an Asian American context, and puts it in the form of really trying to be aggressive about offensively attacking the roots of state violence. And it's I think it's a challenge for us as a community to do the same thing. Um, and I also have a, a brief statement that Mike wanted to share with you tonight. Um, so I'm going to read it if it's okay. Um, he says, I anticipate retaliation for my work, but nothing's like experience. The experience of a supermax prison, at being cargo and the feeling of utter helplessness. Despite all of this, because of all of this, and in the middle of all this, there's nothing like experiencing joy. The joy in knowing that my work is appreciated, that my energy is affirmed, my strength and determination is renewed, and with your support I look forward to the ensuing struggle. As for struggle, Eddie Zhang is nearing a year in, lo in, in solitary confinement. Rico Remedio's security level was raised and he is now at Solano State Prison. Both these men have spent most of their lives in prison. Both were model and disciplinary free prisoners nearing parole. Yet both did not hesitate joining the struggle. I am confident with your support the Asian American community soon will be receiving two men of extraordinary integrity and character. Your gain will be my loss. Eddie, Rico, and I are very fortunate. Community support is a privilege few captive people enjoy. For this, I send my deepest gratitude. Two years ago, before deciding to challenge CDC's racial segregation policy, a factor I weighed was my relative youth. I feared I would not be able to handle the rigors of the anticipated retaliation if I was much older. Yuri showed me that my fears were misplaced. There's nothing like experience. <laughs> I love you and thank you for your unconditional support. Always in struggle, Mike. So, um, that last comment was kind of a good segue. We have also. Oh, do you want to talk about? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, we were just we we have the honor of having some some folks here tonight. So. Okay. So. Just a, just a quick recap, so the, the two different cases, the one about ethnic studies, the three guys that signed the petition, it was, la it was, it was signed last spring, spring 2002, and they're all thrown... Just check, check, okay. Um, they were thrown into the hole immediately, where Eddie still remains today, ten months later. The other two were transferred to other prisons, um, so that's the one, and then also on the racial segregation case, um, Really quick basic uh, points on that is that m almost every prisoner in California is classified as either black, white, Hispanic, or other. And uh, inmates are strongly encouraged, if not forced, to share a cell with um, an inmate of the same racial classification. And the Department of Corrections also practices what they call group punishment, which is you know basically if two black inmates get into a fight, all the black inmates are put on lockdown. Mm -hmm. If a black and a white inmate get in a fight, all the black and all the white inmates get placed on lockdown. They say it's most. Not always the white. <laughs> Not always the white. But, um, and they say that's in the interest of inmate safety. It's clearly a uh, way to uh, keep racial divisions there and exploit them. And oftentimes they set um, different racial groups against each other. Um, so that's what Mike's doing. Mike is in, he's taking that to court and he's challenging that policy as a violation of the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. And um, so now back to what Sharon was saying. We, we have the honor today of having family members of both Eddie Zhang and Mike Noah here. Mm -hmm. And so first I'd like to bring up um, the family of Eddie Zhang. They can come up. Mm -hmm. 
Mrs. Lane. And then uh, Mike Noah's parents as well. Can they come up? I can talk English. She changed it. I'm going to translate for Eddie's parents. Uh, very thank you. 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 Thank he said thank you so much to the Asian Prisoner Support Committee for organizing this event tonight and thank you everyone for showing up and showing your support. Um, our whole family came here in 1982. I have three children. Um, Two sons and a daughter, and the youngest one is Eddie. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I have three sons and a daughter, and the youngest one is Eddie. I have three sons and a daughter, and the we're not doing too bad now. I have um, um, my oldest son and my daughter are um, doing very well and um, you know, are are making it and um, are uh, realizing their their potential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what's really unfortunate is that my youngest son Eddie, as soon as he came to the U.S. Um, you know, met with bad luck and misfortune and, um, you know, didn't realize his potential and ended up in jail. Mm. Um, I guess in this world when you commit a crime, you get punished, but you know, Eddie has been punished and he's been in prison for 16 years already. Uh, Eddie, uh, 
佢向監獄，從高中一直到大學學習畢業，好多人幫助佢。But while in prison, you know, Eddie has um, bettered himself through um, education and has gotten a lot of help from um, people to um, just, I guess, realize his potential. Because of all the help that he's gotten while he's in prison and all the work that he's done on himself, you know, he's at a place now, even though he's in prison, where he he is doing, um, you know, pretty well for himself. Um, what makes me feel good and, and proud is knowing that Eddie is doing really well in prison and what makes me really happy is knowing that he's turned a bad situation into something that's really positive for himself. So I'm really touched by everyone being here tonight and um, also touched by you know your energy and you know the positive feelings that I get from people here. Um, I, I think your participation in this event um, is very critical and important. Righteous. Righteous. Oh, you, you should come up here. I thought you were going to miss that one. You are very strong. Eddie, 嚟講啊，我認為佢響監獄嘅表現係非常做，佢你哋支持啊，冇支持錯啊，佢能夠表現咁好啊，大家誒幫助佢，能夠早日出嚟啊，我覺得你哋即係再支持佢，特別係最近
this is the first time I, I attended a, a meeting like this, and I'm, I'm deeply appreciate uh, all your uh, attention and uh, all the attendees. Uh, I don't need an interpreter. <laughs> Uh, first, I'd like to, uh, to thank the APFC uh, for uh, inviting me and, and my wife. And uh, it's not a time, good time to uh, de deliver any speech here. I, I uh, jot out a couple of uh, points. I would like to uh, uh, put some emphasis on, on, on this kind of uh, uh, struggle for uh, social justice. Uh, I'm a Tung NGO, and uh, my, my wife, my life. We we were both uh, educators. Uh, I came to the United States in uh, 1957 and attended many, many military uh, things uh, as a former officer of uh, the Vietnamese Army. And uh, uh, after that, I had been uh, sent to uh, the University of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for my uh, master's degree in uh, international relations. I came home and uh, I, uh, I built a small university in the Mako Delta and uh, became dean of that university and we, we taught for five years before uh, the fall of Saigon in South Vietnam. So I was, uh, during the time working uh, at a university as a dean, I was uh, elected to the uh, Vietnamese Congress Saigon, in Saigon and uh, I joined the uh, uh, educational committee, committee of, of the Congress. So I, I have some uh, legal background. Uh, my son Mike was uh, unlucky. Uh, he uh, let, let, let me tell you a little about the crime that he committed uh, in 1987. Yeah, 88. Uh, he uh, attended a musical uh, performance down in San Jose with four other friends. And they, they, uh, they drank uh, a couple beers, and they uh, get into a fight with another group, and the other group was called uh, a, a kind of some sort of a gang. So on the way home, they both drove two two car on uh, 101, and uh, I'll send my car with four other his friends. Happened to have a pistol and I don't know who fired at the other car to kill one kid in the other car. Now, when the police caught all of them and they didn't know who uh, pressed the trigger and uh, after a couple of weeks of investigation, uh, my son uh, uh, raised up and said that I, I did it. Now, up to now, after 15 years in jail, uh, we are, as parents, we, 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 we fail to, to make him talk. Who pressed the trigger of that crime? And the four other, other uh, friends of Mike already released after three to five years in jail. They are now uh, uh, free. And I asked each one of them, and none of them would like to talk about. So, a couple of years ago, one, one of my relatives disclosed to me that one of the person who pressed the trigger that night, now he's outside, he's free. So it is possible for me to ask another lawyer to uh, bring up this case uh, in order to, uh, to free my son. This is uh, part of the legal uh, uh, thing that uh, we would like to embark on in the future. That right now we would like to uh, uh, call your attention on the, the uh, fundamental problem of, of the uh, uh, prisons in, in California. Uh, as you all know, that, and I'm, I'm so uh, pleased and, and encouraged that uh, most of you here are very young and uh, I uh, uh, one time had uh, taught in a, in a university. Uh, I taught international relations, and I, I'm so encouraged to see uh, most of you over here and uh, so uh, active, uh, aiming at uh, something in the future and probably 
you are future future leaders of this uh, community and uh, this nation. The bottom line, the bottom line, the, the fundamental problem of the California Department of Corrections is that they, together with the with the uh, uh, police officers' organizations, uh, they they are number one contributor to uh, uh, electoral campaign, and they elected uh, public officials in uh, the leg legislature and and in the executive branch, and they they perpetuate they they just they just prolong their reign as a as some sort of complex, and it, it's 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 a uh, it's very very uh, complicated but very simple thing. To, to watch, and uh, you can uh, watch the budget, $5.2 billion for the California Department of Correction for this year. And uh, Governor Gray Davis cut down the education program, but increase, increase the budget for the California Department of Correction. This, that's the bottom line. And uh, when they have uh, contributed to the electoral campaign, and uh, and help elect public of officials. Uh, they these public officials voted for the fat, very fat, big budget for the Department of Corrections. And these people, the Department of Corrections, together with police officers' uh, organization, contributed very fat, fat contribution to the electoral campaigns. And with that kind of money. We see a vicious circle. Uh, it will prolong forever. So that that's the bottom line. And I I I, I encourage and I wish uh, you people over here may think of some strategy to break that circle. And this is my message. And I thank you very much for your attention. It was really great to talk to the parents. We also um, we wanted to do our best tonight for you guys get to get to know the Sequin Three as well. We couldn't have an audio cast tonight, um, but we do have a video clip that was taken, I think, um, 2001, and this was some of the work that they were doing in the education program. It was really a space, to, um, one of the only spaces that they could use to create dialogue. It's fitting that we are gathered here tonight in Locus, a place designed to promote Asian Pacific American consciousness and community. Even though at this moment, I'm locked in a four and a half by eight by 11 foot cell in San Quentin's solitary confinement, my thoughts and spirit are with all of you. By now, you probably have an idea of what the benefit is promoting. Since the mass building of the prison industrial complex, the Asian Pacific American prison population has been on a rise. Women are the fastest growing segment of the prison population. And it is difficult to know the exact number of Asian American prisoners because there are no statistics. We have been marginalized and without a voice for decades. There is a lack of concern and activism around Asian American prisoners. The fear of losing face and the unawareness of prison issues prevent a large segment of the Asian American community from getting involved. It is not shameful to acknowledge that Asian Americans do make wrong choices in their lives and end up in prisons. It is only shameful if the Asian American community remains silent and does nothing. As an Asian prisoner who has been incarcerated for over 17 years, I could not have survived the oppressions and brutalities of the prison system without the continuous support from my family and friends in the community. However, there are those who are not as fortunate as I am to have the support. They're struggling and they need help. That brings us to why we're here tonight. It, took, it only took a spark to bring a community of like-minded people together and make the benefit for the Asian Prisoner Support Committee a reality. I implore you to take action, join forces with the Asian Prisoner Support Committee, and raise consciousness about the prison industrial complex and issues around Asian American prisoners. Family and community support are crucial for the survival and rehabilitation of Asian American prisoners. It's time to break the silence and speak out. I want to take this opportunity to thank some people who have been supporting Asian American prisoners and made tonight's event possible. I want to thank the founder of Locust, Julia Kim, for providing this community space and resources for all Asian Americans. I want to thank Bao Fi, Ishil Park, Shaoja Patel, and the 18 Mighty Mountain Warriors for donating the time to share their arts and passion for social justice with us. I want to thank Asian Week's editor, Neela Banerjee, for sticking her neck out to give Asian American prisoners a voice. I want to thank my attorney, Keith Watley, from the Prison Law Office for helping with my parole in the last three years, and Charles Carbone from the California Prison Focus for helping the San Quentin through. I want to thank the members of the committee for spending hours in meetings to brainstorm and organize this event. 
I also want to thank them for their dedication and efforts in helping me, Mike, and Rico in our struggles. I love all of you. Mm. Mm. To my shiro, Yuri Kochiyama. <laughs> Your selfless, humble, and true revolutionary spirit inspires me to be good and righteous. It's a blessing to be in the presence of your greatness in un under ordinary circumstances. Thank you. To my family and friends, your love and support sustain me. With you on my side, I can't lose. I love you. To my parents, I thank you for all your love and sacrifice for me. Baba, Mama, wo me. Finally, I share in political prisoner Leonard Peltier's feelings when he said, to those of us locked away in prison, there's nothing more important than being remembered. Tonight, all the Asian American prisoners were remembered by you. On behalf of my brothers Mike, Rico, Stefan, and all the incarcerated Asian American brothers and sisters, my heart bows to you. People in the house, like I still try to consider myself young. Give it up! <laughs> because my boyfriend used to be in the Marines like a lifetime ago, but, you know, he could still technically be on call for this crazy war, which is insane, you know? And um, so I wrote this, it's just called An Open Letter to Girls of Soldiers, based on what's happening now, and I tried to let it, write a letter to the soldiers, but I couldn't, so this is to the girls. <laughs> okay, maybe I need a mic scan. Open letter to the girls of soldiers. Hello, you. Ladies made beautiful by longing. I want to talk to you intimately about the shape of war across your front lawn, the hours spent screening the TV, the shape of your arms and his legs entwined like yellow ribbons in sleep. At night, you lay with the, soldier, the boy who plays soldier by day. You know his fumbling fingers, the ox of his tor torso, and you know how desperately he wants to be a hero. The night is moonless in both countries, looted of its stars, only your eyes unblinking. There, bombs weep like thunder and bullets like a hard, hard rain. And I will not, I will not ask you to weep for the other women there, sleepless in bed, craving the almond scent of their own men, hurling prayers at a noiseless foreign god, because your thoughts are already heavy. Perhaps in your dreams, you carry them anyway. Your daytime thoughts have their own small orbit. This one man, marching out like an ant with his tiny helmet into a vast battlefield, a horizon of bleak orange dust, into a land where his tongue is dust, and the planes and the motives of his home country fly miles over his head. He is there to follow orders, to try to be a hero, and to try to be a good man. What can we do then? I ask you with empty hands. I ask you as a woman who also loves a boy soldier, who also loves a boy man. What can we do then? I ask you. We who are too proud to weep. We who wait like pebbles, small, hard, shining. We whose mouths stay silent as ripped pages when all we want to say is undo the frayed ribbons and the lust for larger freedoms or kingdoms. Stop the failing war and bring us back our beautiful, flailing men before their eyes turn from water to stone before our lives break like frayed rope, and before war invades the country of our bed. Maybe at night we should start a rebellion. Tell them to shoot in the wrong direction. Hide under covers. Tell them there is no wind and song when you die a young legend. Be a hero playing PlayStation with your son. Be a man and hold me as if we've just begun. Yes, this is a love poem tucked inside of a war poem for women left 
with bruises, love bites, roses, babies, and longing stretched wider than any flag. For men who tuck our best wallet-sized pictures under their head to cradle them and all of their told and untold dreams. For lovers who care deeply about the steadiness of each, of each other's breath, who would hold fast to one another's broken bodies, who would give anything to see the world whole enough to hold us all. To see the world whole. To see the world whole. We are the ones who will open the doors home. So um, next I'm going to read this poem by Eddie Zeng, you know, the guy who sings for his guitar. <laughs> he was incredible. And this poem, when I read it, I was just sitting in my apartment and it just made me start crying. And then I wrote a poem completely copying his poem, right? <laughs> so maybe I'll read that if there's time, but this is his. I mean, copying the form, you know, whatever. <laughs> because it inspired me so much. But this is his. Both of them are kind of long, because it's called Autobiography at 33. So this is autobiography, you know. <laughs> and it's by Ed Zing. I'm 33 years old and breathing. It's a good year to die. To myself, I never felt such extreme peace, besides being mired in constant ear-deafening screams from the caged occupants, triple CMS, PCs, gang-validated dropouts, parole violators, lifers, drug casualties, three strikers, human beings. In San Quentin's 150-year-old solitary confinement, I don't want to start things over at 33. I'm very proud of being who I am. I wrote a letter to a stranger who said, you deserve to lose at least your youth, not returning to society until well into middle age, after reading an article about me in the San Francisco Weekly. I told him, a hundred years from now, when we no longer exist on this earth of humankind, the serious of my crime will not be changed or lessened. I can never pay back my debt to the victims because I cannot turn back the hands of time, and I will not judge you. Whenever I think about my crime, I feel ashamed. I've lost my youth and more. I've learned that the more I suffer, the stronger I become. I am blessed with great friends. I talk better than I write because the police can't hear my conversation. The prison officials labeled me a troublemaker. I dared to challenge the administration for its civil rights violations. I fought for ethnic studies in the pr prison college system. I've been a slave for 16 years under the 13th Amendment. I know separation and disappointment ultimately. I've memorized the united front points of unity. I love my family and friends. My hero, Yuri Kochiyama, and a young sister named Monica, who is pretty, who came to visit me. <laughs> Somehow, I have more female friends than male friends. I have never made love to a woman. Sometimes I feel like 16, but my body disagrees. Some people called me a square because I don't drink, smoke, or do drugs. I'm a procrastinator, but I get things done. I've never been back to my motherland. I started to speak Spanish. Escribió una poema en español. At times, I can be very selfish and vice versa. I've never been to a prom, a concert, opera, sporting event, or my parents' house. I don't remember the last time I cried. I've sweat with the Native Americans, attended mass with the Catholics, went to service with the Protestants, sat and chanted with the Buddhists, but my mind is my church. I'm spoiled. In 2001, a young lady stopped loving me. It felt worse than losing my freedom. I was denied parole for the ninth time. I assured mom I will be home one day after she pleaded me to answer her question truthfully. Are you ever going to get out of prison? The prison industrial complex and its masters attempted to control my mind. It didn't work. They don't know that I've been introduced to Che, Yuri Kochiyama, Paulo Freire, Howard Zinn, Frederick Douglass, El Asada Shakur, Bell Hooks, Maurice Comfort, Malcolm X, Gandhi, George Jackson, Mumia, Buddha, and many others. I've had about a hundred books in my cell. I was internalizing my politics. In 2000, I organized the first poetry slam in San Quentin. Yeah. I earned my Associate of Art degree, 
Something I never thought possible. I self-published a zine. I was the poster boy for San Quentin. Sometime in the 90s, my grandparents died without knowing that I was in prison. At 30, I kissed my dad on the cheek and told him that I love him for the first time. I've written my first poem. I called myself a poet to motivate me to write because I knew that poets would set us free. In 1998, I was granted parole. Then it was taken away. The governor's political career superseded my life. Sometime in the 90s, I participated in most of the self-help programs. In 1996, I really learned how to read and write. I read my first history book, A People's History of the United States. My socially conscious mind was awakened. In 1992, I passed my GED in Solano Prison. I learned how to take care of my body from 89 to 93. In 87, I turned 18 and went to the pen from Youth Authority, the youngest prisoner in San Quentin's maximum security prison. I was lucky because people thought I knew Kung Fu. <laughs> At 16, I violated an innocent family of four and scarred them for life. Money superseded human suffering. I was charged as an adult and sentenced to life with the possibility, no hablo inglés, I wished I could start things over. I was completely lost. At 12, I left communist China to capitalist America. No hablo inglés, I was spoiled. In 1976, I went to demonstrations against the gang of four. Life was a blur from one to six. On 5-29-69, I inhaled my first breath. She is so humble. She is the most humble person I know. And she would probably hate me saying this, but Yuri Kochiyama is a living legend. <laughs> For over 40 years, she's dedicated her life to advancing struggles with people of color and raising awareness about political prisoners. She's worked with Malcolm X, She's worked with the Panthers. She's worked with everybody. And um, I was in college when I met her in New York. She worked for the Free, well, she started the Free David Wong Committee in New York. And so um, I remember just taking the train all the way up to Harlem and going to Yuri's apartment. And it was incredible because this woman, I, have heard, I had heard about her like from when I was younger. And she was such an inspiration to me. And here she was, literally, every week, working tirelessly like, Three hours a night, we'd have these meetings that drag on for a long time. But you know, she was there with the cookies, and she was there with the smiles, and she was there. She made everybody feel so comfortable and welcomed into her home. You know, she makes you feel welcomed. She's incredible. And there's a quote from her here at the bottom of this page that just says, Don't become too narrow. Live fully. Meet all kinds of people. You'll learn something from everyone. Follow what you feel in your heart. And Yuri, you are our heart. So. Incredible feeling to be here. My tuko. It's an incredible feeling to be here among all of you young people, and to think that you were you came here because you wanted to learn about prisoners. That doesn't happen that often. <coughs> I don't know where to begin to tell you how. What a warm and wonderful feeling it is to be with people 
you are so, I could see in your faces, so sincerely and completely interested in Asian American prisoners. We really need to support them. Um, Asian Prisoner Support Committee organized, it's new, you know, and we hope some of you will join, but organized with the hope that they could open a new world to you. And that world is the prison world. It is a world that I don't think most of us here know very little about. Because there's a difference between visiting a prisoner and doing 15, 20, 25 years. I want to thank, I, I couldn't believe it that they were going to do it, that 18 mighty mountain warriors mm -hmm. are sitting right there. <laughs> imagine how excited I was when I heard you were really coming. <laughs> and I want to thank Greg Watanabe and Tamlin Tomita, who I think are the two that got you to come. So thank you so much. I don't know, did Harold leave? Or I don't see oh, okay, He was on an hour's sleep. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Uh, I want to, of course, thank all the other brilliant, brilliant spoke, what do you call them? Word, spoke <laughs> words. <laughs> <laughs> we never have anything like that in our times. Or maybe we call them poets. But spoken word with a little rap and stuff. <laughs> Voice. I mean, it was wonderful to hear your autobiography as well as Eddie's. I know Eddie's things, things also made me cry, but you are so open, and we thank you for sharing all that with us. And um, I want to thank also the loving, devoted parents and family members of Mike and Eddie. I think really, really a glorious thing when parents support their children who are in prison. It doesn't always happen. We need to know more about prisons and who are in there and especially who are the Asian prisoners. What are they doing there? Well, at least tonight you found out that they're fighting for ethnic studies. Can you imagine prisoners fighting for ethnic studies? It shows what they are in themselves. They are not just prisoners. They are people who want to learn as much as possible about different Asians. They are people who have made many, many friends in prison, and many more friends outside, because these three Asians have so many people who support them. But in the state of California, we have a governor who is probably the worst, who has probably the worst record of releasing prisoners, even prisoners who the parole board agreed to release, like the case of Eddie Zeng. But Eddie is still in prison, and they just moved him. And so are Mike and Rico. We must stay behind them. We must write to them. We must let them know that we are thinking of them. Think of people, <coughs> other prisoners, like the Puerto Rican prisoners, who did 25 years, and uh, Geronimo Pratt, who was also in San Quentin, and did 27 years, but people supported them. In the black and Puerto Rican communities, people have served long, long times, and then there are those like, 
remember the names all of a sudden my mind goes off but uh oh my gosh somebody help me the guy who has done 40 years in a prison in california luciana yeah. mcgee and then there's geez, there's so many who are in their 38th and 36th years and yet people have supported them see i hope no oh what's her name not uh Nyasha is the last name, a young Panther woman who has been writing to the Panther prisoners for 40 years. Many people in prison have transformed themselves to a different kind of person. Many have finished college in prison and have college degrees. Many people in prison have been framed. Others were unfortunate that a witness lied. There are those who could not pay for a lawyer or who had a lawyer that had no interest in their case and gave a poor defense. The criminal justice system is more criminal than the prisoners inside. How many prisoners have been executed when they were innocent all the way from Sacco and Vincetti? And then 50 years later, the state of Massachusetts apologized and said they're innocent. How many thousand young prisoners have been traumatized for life because of prison rapes? And they happened because the guards didn't care. The authorities didn't care. And how many of those raped prisoners have committed suicide? They don't tell us about these statistics so we must know what's happening in prison. We must know what's happening to our Asians. But for the long-termers who have been there 40 years or more, they shouldn't even be in there. There are new penal codes that says there is going to be in California. No more indeterminate sentences. And yet those people are doing time in California. <coughs> There's something wrong with this country when there are more than two million people in prison, most of them of color, but probably one million blacks. 150,000 are women and 50,000 in prison are there for nonviolent crimes. California has built 22 prisons in 20 years and only one university. That's par for the course for other states with high imprisonment like <coughs> Texas and New York. Many Asian prisoners were erroneously charged with crimes because of the lack of knowledge of their English, of the English language, or given poor defense, or those who have been outright, rightly fra uh, framed. There isn't time to go through the many Asian prisoners that I would like to, but I just want to mention two. One is a Korean man, you may have heard of him, by the name of Han Tak Lee. He was charged with murdering his 10-year-old daughter and also with arson. What happened was that a fire broke out in his house and his daughter was trapped in one of the rooms, probably the bathroom. He tried many times to go through the fire and rescue her, but the fire got bigger and bigger and then the house was burned down and she was found later. But when his case came into the court, some people testified that they felt he was, he was really the one who did it because he didn't show emotion, that he didn't cry. But maybe many Asian men do not know how to show emotion when they are stunned, when they are shocked, losing their own child. It wasn't until 10 years later, I don't know where the case stands now, but 
but he finally found a lawyer that could prove that that house that was set fire was not arson. It was a, what do you call it, electrical wire. What do you call it? It was a, can't think of the word, you know, where uh, the, uh, there's a defective uh, electrical wiring, and that's what started the fire. I hope that his lawyers will keep fighting for him till he's out, because he did not commit arson, he did not commit murder. Please know that these things happen to Asians, and not just Asian men, thousands of prisoners. In the 1986 David Wong case, as some of you are familiar with, he is in an upstate prison, and his case is finally coming to a close. All the people who have ever been a part of the David Wong committee were all emailing each other and just praying and hoping that he's going to make it. Because if he does not, he has to do 25 to life. Yet, on April 10 and 11, and I hope April 10th was a good luck day because it was his birthday. But after 17 years of waiting, he finally got a hearing. He got a two-day hearing, but he's asking for two more. But we don't know if we're going to be able to raise the money to bring the two witnesses from Dominican Republic. Maybe, I, well, I'm sure in New York, they are trying to raise that money. David Wong absolutely did not kill the guy who was stabbed to death. He wasn't near enough. He just happened to go over to see who was stabbed. And when everybody else was running hither and thither, but he was not that prison wise at that time, and he did not know English. Luckily, he was with one other Chinese. There were only two Asians, these two Chinese, who were in the Clinton prison, which is right near the Canadian border, where it holds 2,000 prisoners. And here, these two Asians, how could the, uh, the guard, the tower guard, who was a hundred yards away and equivalent to the third floor, say that he knew that they were Asians who killed the black guy who was stabbed. He could never have been able to see uh, on March 12th, which was a cold day, to see, and when everybody is wearing the same clothes and half the people were wearing hoods because it was cold, and he could dare to say it was an Asian, and he picked David Wong because he didn't know English. The other guy, seeking Chong, knew English quite well. But now, we hope within a week, we are going to know what will happen to David Wong. And I am so grateful to all the people who have supported him not only 17 years because he's been in prison, 19 years. It happened the second year when he was there. There are people like Mary Choi, who's my age, who passed away a few years ago, who got so many people from Hawaii to donate money to the David Wong case. We have people who were once in the David Wong case who are now in Minnesota, and they started a David Wong committee there. There are, and out of some 40 people that were once in the David Wong committee, eight of them have become lawyers. So let's remember all the kind of things that prisoners go through. And that statement by an injustice to one is an injustice to all. Let's remember that it's people of all backgrounds who have 
gone through injustices after injustices. Please know that the words freedom, justice, and equality should not be considered as any kind of adjectives for this country. But we, all of us, must, must strive to make it one day a country where there will be freedom, justice, and equality. And let's begin with giving our support to those in prison. Thank you.